Chapter 1 The Birth of the Saviour The trees by the Ganga Ghat dangled gently, wavering through the air in a quaint pride, seemingly intoxicated by the entrancing scent of moss, as their stems were getting washed off by the mighty curving streams of Holy River Ganga. Shafts of gleaming moonlight gently fell on their tops and slipped softly down to the edges of their hazel shadows, seeping deep down into the moist soil. They lifted their bulky branches to the sky as if their very presence was enough to beat back the hours of darkness by dominating the moonlight to fall on their supple papery leaves. The silvery sheet of the river surface dimmed and lightened with every passing of a cloud. A wind whispered through the branches and was reciprocated by the chirping of night wanderers. The consecrated flag ruffled by the shrill waft of air on the circular compounds of a temple waved elegantly as if they were hailing for a convivial commencement of some divine arrival. The night lamps blazing through the interlacing windows spread blistering radiance in the entire ashram of Kalipeet, which descended moderately to its core, where situated the temple of Ma Kali, the goddess of war, death, time and protection, also symbolic of shield, shelter and motherly love for her worshippers. Inside the temple, in a curved row, were sitting the chief sages and monks of the ashram, reciting their solemn holy prayers in deep divine tone of chanting hymns. The sound of their soft sacred chanting echoed slightly louder inside the walls of the temple, apparently piercing serenely through the mud bricks reached up high spreading all over till the corner of the widespread monastery located at the foothill of Himalayas. Unlike their regular early morning routine, these midnight prayers were the first ever occasion to take place in the ashram for a very special cause, the purpose of healing and soothing a soul in a twinge. With the help of their powerful and divine tools that were abundant in energy and plentiful of strength and solidity, they were actually to dwindle the pain in the womb of a woman who was struggling through the strong cramping in her abdomen, groin and back in the onset of parturition. After the long hours of struggle on one side and the patience on the other, the sages all of a sudden heard the buzzing of a temple bell that hung right in the deep hollow center of the ceiling. The bell rang as loud as a trumpet being swiftly hit by an unyielding gush of air and then gradually followed by a gentle cry of a newborn that briskly vibrated in the empty environment of a barren morning hours while the sun was still travelling in the far away lands. The sages delicately ceased their chanting, opened their eyes and with those soft calm looks smiling in unparalleled divinity, bowed to the idol of the goddess in their pure gratitude. It was not an ordinary night for the sages of Kalipeet as their eyelids could not come even a bit close to seas for the sleep, they kept maneuvering around to embrace the divine souls into her bosom until the we are subsided into the dawn of redemption. By the mercy of Ma Kali, everything has gone well. Let's now bless the child for his long life and glory, said the old monk, standing with joined hands in front of the idol of the goddess. His tone was decisive of what he proclaimed with his deep faith about the instance for what they had adhered to for the last whole night. The sages walked through the pavement of colossal corridor of the shrine towards the hut to see the newborn where he was born. Wrapped in a faded saffron cotton cloth, the newborn was brought out of a small bamboo hut. 
the monk and sages bless the child with the best of their words and blessings sprinkling holy water from their small round copper pots around him some tiny cold drops pecked lightly on the child's flimsy skin that made his body wriggle twirling his cute little face within the scoop of the cloth rubbing his puny ears by its pleats which made the monk's smile gently in affection they were overblamed by the elegance and the grace of the child's face their praises for the child did not seem to stop in their unceasing words of benediction unless one of them had to remind themselves for leaving for their early morning prayers right then as the sages left and vanished into the foggy distance a gentle soft voice is splashed from inside the hut ostensibly impatient for recouping the child in her arms please bring my child to me said the mother pushing herself upright against the wooden pole of a stiff log that erected by a jute mat on which she had been sprawling over the previous night the ladies dressed in bleached maroon simple clothing precisely looking like may servants immediately gave the child in his mother's arms and started to pour words of positive reception in order to appease the lady of superior grace who had been struggling to arise from an acute pain both physically as well as mentally what a wonderful child his grace is more charming than the lord of beauty the majestic moon himself and his elegance will bring down the egotism of the lord of fire the flame haired agni said the ladies in a unified sequence their praises were true to their nature as it could perceptibly validate their pure love concern and affection for both the child and the mother the graceful lady fondly looked at her child her face beamed with boundless love and affection for him her lips smiled in glee and eyes dripped with tears and in those tears it seemed to dilute all her pain and suffering she had been dealing with she would gather him close to her bosom again and again and kiss him every time she had glanced at his sweet little charming face seeing that woman showering her child with a plenty of tenderness and love would warm even the hearts frozen inside the lifeless substance while the ones witnessing it were still the living ones then how was it not possible for them to burst forth in a flood of tears but uh, are you really going to keep him queen kusumati asked the first maid in soft low voice categorically frowning in displeasure and wiping her tears this sudden intervention of her with some particular concern baffled the situation on to a divergent extent her question would let the silence prevail in their dwelling for a while until kusumati broke it in an absolute attempt to overturning all her soreness accompanied with vulnerable emotions we must leave before the sun reaches the highest sky we can't leave any trace of possibility for people to ascertain any suspicion about who we truly are and where we belong she paused for a while as if pondering over something and then continued jenti you pack our things ah she paused for a moment and then abruptly said to the maid uh, before that give me my shawl let me feed my child well she paused again for a whim while trying to sustain duly on her charge vishakha you go and inform the chief sage acharyashri guru krupa that we have to take his acquiescence now ordered kusumati with trembling voice swallowed in fretful thoughts in haste of casting up all their traces from their temporary domicile furthermore to heading for her journey ahead then she quickly wrapped herself with a shawl and started feeding the baby vishakha promptly ran towards the yagya bhumi the place where sages performed their rituals in front of a sacred fire 
she bowed to acharya shri guru kripa and hastily communicated the message given by kusumati in a querying tone devi parnavi seeks your kind permission to leave for her home now she stood still with her head drooping down perhaps to keep away from the sudden jolt by the sage at her peculiar request acharya shri guru kripa and his wife reached in a while to the hut where kusumati had spent her crucial maternity months living as non detachable part of their holy abode they were astounded to see her already standing outside the sheikh and holding the baby in her arms with jayanti by her side clutching a bale of wrapped clothes and some other belongings they were carried along with them to the ashram it seemed that the ladies were downright on an instant verge of leaving without more ado which left the stern signs of bewilderment on their faces wondering why she had wanted to leave in such frail condition acharya shri guru kripa and his wife entreated her tenderly with soft low voice dear child you are still in a vulnerable state you need rest and care you should stay for some more days we just hope not to have hurt your emotions by any way and left a chance for any complaint by mistake said the sage's wife kusumati looked at sage's wife with watery eyes and spoke softly your love and care have been nothing less than that of my own mother and from acharyashri i have accumulated not only blessings but knowledge and learning in abundance which only a father could do for her own daughter the great sages and people of this ashram are pure divine souls who have looked after us as one of their own family members then how can i carry any complaint from here the water slithered down her cheeks as she spoke further but i am bound to my karma as well as the words given to my husband for my return to home right after the completion of these granted days as i promised to him the heartrending words of kusumati melted the hearts of the couple they smiled in gratefulness child parnavi is right promise to her husband must be fulfilled this is the sign of a righteous wife truly faithful towards the duty and virtues for her husband said the great sage acharya shri guru kripa oh now i know how can we forget that the child's father must also be eager to see his son but i wonder if he would have returned from his devout trance from the abode of himalayas exclaimed sage's wife he must have come and if still hasn't then he must definitely be on his way back home and by the time we reach he would also be back interrupted with full jayanti and we will have something to prepare for his welcome added vishakha with a sick smile on her half witted face hmm i understand please wait till i return said the sage's wife and went away for a while as she returned she held a small trident shaped silvery pendant knotted in a black thread in her hand this small sacred symbol of ma kali's powerful trident will protect him from all the evil eyes said the sage's wife tying the silver charm around little child's neck leaving the pendant placed on his petait chest kusumati bowed again and thank the couple expressing her innermost gratitude towards their kindness with your blessings my child will be protected from all the straits and will return into a virtuous man i am indebted to you for my whole life he will not turn just into an ordinary virtuous man but a victor of justice benevolence and nobility he will unequivocally become the savior of mankind i can read it on his face said the sage as he poured some water into his right palm from the copper vessel that hung in his left hand
and sprinkled the drops of water onto the child. Kusumati stood in an appealingly moderate posture, frozen to the prediction of the sage. She was certainly not surprised about the grace her child owned as acknowledged by the sages, but was definitely numb under her torpid feelings. Please allow me to take your leave now. She mumbled softly, to which the sage and his wife nodded gently. Kusumati finally left the holy boundaries of the ashram with Jayanti and Vishakha, however, with a very heavy heart and perennially dripping eyes. On their way back to their hometown, as they trotted the unknown paths, Kusumati felt weak on, on her contemptible conduct of falsifying her identity and lying to the sacred sages of the Kali Peet Ashram, who had always been very sympathetic and compassionate to her. She stopped with a deep sob and dissolved into words of grief and repentance. I don't know if I am ever going to forgive myself for this misdeed. Oh, my Lord Krishna, help me find the path of virtue. I would do everything to atone for my sins even if I have to give over my whole life burning in repentance. Said Kusumati, sobbing constantly in grave sadness. Calm down, my child, spoke a soft voice. The austerity of the body consists in the worship of the Supreme Lord. The Brahmans, the spiritual master and superiors like father and mother, cleanliness, Simplicity, celibacy and non-violence are also austerities of the body. These should be given proper respect. One should practice cleansing oneself externally and internally and he should learn to become simple in behavior. He should not do anything which is not sanctioned by the scriptural injunction. Anything performed beyond the boundaries of self-command and forbearance bring the consequences that one has to pay and thus to learn from, to set an example for his race. Kusumati stood still like stone, stunned hugely by the echo of the said words, a verse from Bhagavad Gita, the holy book she had been reading all through the months of her pregnancy. She had realized that her penance must be served for what she had done, even though it was done naively under the influence of her powerful Venus. Whereas Jayanti and Vishakha continued to console her by reminding her of the gravitic need of such a situation. The cacophony raged on grievously as their conversation of mixed words went on. The intermingling voices and the querying thoughts blended in an intense hypnotic atmosphere that dragged Kusumati back in times of yore, where she started glancing through the unanticipated events that had led her into such gross circumstances.